Welcome back to the Bible and its cultural influence. I'm Seth Pace, and today we're going to be looking at the cinematic savior or how Jesus is interpreted in film. Now, when we go back and look at scholars such as Francis Schaeffer, they talk about how when Jesus is interpreted or brought forth into modern culture, we tend to bring certain biases, uh, certain proclivities and cultural traits, and we put them onto him. Sometimes that's good, sometimes not so much. Uh, we end up um, with a term called mythopoeic, which means the building of a myth. So in the case of, say, Lucifer and angels, Dante and Milton have done more probably to warp our view of them than anybody else. And I've talked to people and had them express ideas about angels and Lucifer that is straight out of Dante and Milton, not out of scripture, but because they have taken this in and it's become part of our culture, they assume that it's scripture. Now, not all interpretations are bad. Some different interpretations uh, can actually offer a brand new insight into how we should view God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Case for this would be C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. We have the fantastic interpretation of the Christ figure through the character of Aslan. And young children especially are really fascinated with this. They love the idea of a big lion being friendly with Susan and Lucy and the boys. But when you get to the passage where they're inside the beaver home with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and Lucy, I believe, asks, if he is safe because they finally find out that Aslan is not a man but he is a lion and Mr. Beaver responds oh no not at all he is not safe but he is good and that is a fascinating thing to introduce to a child who's first reading that series the idea that you can be powerful and meek meaning holding your strength in reserve and good and still have the potential to fight and defend. And so that is a great interpretation in that case, because I think it helps broaden our view and especially help young children understand this concept. But today we're going to focus mainly on how does cinema interpret Jesus and some are good and some interpretations again, not so much. So this begins back in 1895 with the invention of what we call the motion picture. And only two years later, we have the Passion in French that came out. It was only 12 scenes, uh, lasted about five minutes. There it really were basically still lifes. And the first feature film didn't come out until 1903. As you see, they have the Passion of the Christ. Since then, we've had over 170 films made depicting the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, Hollywood doesn't treat religion with any sort of respect, but Jesus does really well at the box office. And Hollywood acknowledges that, and that's one of the reasons so many films are made depicting his life. Now, there are some issues whenever you're dealing with this, and one of them is, of course, how do you depict Jesus? Because if you make him too good looking, it's... So starting with the Hollywood epic, in the 1950s, uh, around 1953, we get a movie called The Robe, which is based on the novel by Douglas. And then in 1959, Ben-Hur comes out. Now, in the 50s, these films were huge productions. They had elaborate sets, costumes, thousands of extras, grand musical scores with full orchestras. Uh, they had widescreen technicolor and cinemascope. And in King of Kings, which was made in the early 60s, in the Sermon on the Mount scene alone, there were over 400 sets and 7,000 extras for that one scene. Expense was not an issue in the early Hollywood epics. 
But the films, these two that came out in the 1950s, The Robe and Ben-Hur, it's interesting because neither one of them ever showed Jesus. In The Robe, you see Jesus' feet and legs as he's on the cross. And of course, it focuses on the centurion who ends up with Jesus' robe, going to find out what this early group of teachings is about. And then in Ben-Hur, you have the scene where a cup of water is being exchanged between uh, Judah Ben-Hur and Jesus. But you are not shown Jesus' face. Um, in early Hollywood, they, for the most part, never did this. It wasn't until the 19th in most of the Hollywood epics, you're going to see the miracles downplayed. There's a greater emphasis on his teachings for the most part. And when we look at the 1960s, we have two films that come along. We have The Greatest Story Ever Told, which was just filled with A-list stars from Hollywood. Um, they even have John Wayne playing the centurion who looks up at the cross and says, surely this was the son of God. But they bring in a Swede, which is Max von Chateau, who is blue eyed and actually blonde to play Jesus. We're going to get in the King of Kings a little bit later. We're going to get Jeffrey Hunter come in. Max von Chateau in The Greatest Story Ever Told, the one on the left, he portrays Jesus as very icy, uh, distant, otherworldly. He never smiles. He never laughs. It does show a couple of healings, but no other miracles, and mainly focuses on his teachings. On the King of Kings, the one on the right with Jeffrey Hunter, it is a constant, it's supposed to be a continuous narrative taken from all of the Gospels. Uh, the history is actually fairly accurate. The teachings of Jesus are stressed, um, but they are universalized. So they did rewrite a little bit of it. And Jeffrey Hunter, as you see in the picture, is blue eyes with red hair and was very, very young for the role. And that's why this particular movie is often called I Was a Teenage Jesus. And... If you're interested in a cultural side note, uh, Jeffrey Hunter, the guy on the right, actually played the part of Captain Christopher Pike, who was the original captain of the USS Enterprise. And this was in 1977, a little bit later. And it's, it's fairly accurate historically. But as you can see, he has incredibly blue eyes. And he even went to, so far as to eat... I think only cheese for 12 days in order to take on this very gaunt appearance whenever they got ready to do the crucifixion scene. Powell tried not to blink the entire movie, which makes it really kind of odd, but it's supposed to give him an otherworldly appearance, like he's always focusing on other things. That Jesus was alive, typically are around 5'5". Five, five, uh, dark brown or black hair, olive skin, brown eyes. Now, they typically wore their hair and beard short. Um, probably a lot shorter, actually, hair length than in these artist interpretations right here you're looking at. But part of that was influence of Romans and others around them. The only references we have as to what Jesus looked like were actually taken from the Hebrew text. We have in Isaiah a comment about what the the Messiah will look like, and and that's Isaiah 53. And then in the 45th Psalm, we have a little bit of a discussion. But that's it in the canon of Scripture. Now later, several centuries later, in the second and third roughly, we do have some other documents and their second and third hand documents talking about his description most of those are discredited if you want to look them up uh, we have the acts of peter and the acts of john they describe jesus as being small and ugly to the ignorant in europe anti-semitism is starting to grow really rampant 
and we have the development of what some people call the Nordic Jesus. And this goes back to actually some passages about a thousand years earlier where we have a couple of people mention that Jesus was actually not Middle Eastern. They wanted to distance their idea of Jesus being a Jew. And one of the ways they distance it is they started talking about that he actually was blonde and blue eyed. He was Nordic. Uh, he may have even been Aryan, which we're not going to go into right now. But as you know, certain groups really jumped on that one a lot. But this is where we think this idea started to grow in art, especially of Jesus being light haired and blue eyed. Now, the inverse of that is in the 20th century, we have the opposite take place. We have what's called the black Jesus being advocated. And even Martin Luther King Jr. advocated this idea. And again, both of them are extremes, uh, most likely. He said Jesus was probably 5'5 five, five or so, pretty strong, brown-haired, olive-skinned, brown-eyed. Yeah, I'm pretty certain he was not blue-eyed and blonde. So let's get back into our second category, which is the musicals. This is outside of my wheelhouse. I don't really have a lane of operations here to go with, so just going to point out that you have Jesus Christ Superstar and Godspell. Both of them came out in the 60s. They were both outcroppings of counterculture. They do offer a little different view of Jesus. Um, and you have Jesus is uh, self-absorbed, full of doubt. Um, he seems to focus on forgiveness and mercy in both of them. But that's about... All I know on those, so we're going to go ahead and skip to the next category, which is Alternative Jesus, which I know a little bit more about. So the first film in the Alternative Jesus genre is the 1989 The Jesus of Montreal. This is a passion play, and it's an interesting interpretation. A lot of people think that this is a masterpiece of cinema. And it's a group of actors who are putting on a passion play about the life and miracles of Jesus. And as they do this, they start to take on and encapsulate his teachings and put them into their own life. They're trying to challenge the traditional interpretations of the Gospels and demythologize Jesus. They focus in the film on his teachings, love, morality, ethics. Uh, the main character who becomes Jesus uh, does die in the end of the film. And he is resurrected in a way through organ donation of giving himself away. The second one is probably the most, one of the most controversial. In 1988... Uh, we have The Last Temptation of Christ. And I remember when this film came out. I just started college. There were all sorts of protests about this film. And mainly because I think a lot of people didn't understand the focal point from the novel, which was written in 1955. It is called The Most Human Jesus on Film. And the point of controversy is that when Jesus is on the cross, the last temptation, the last thing that Lucifer does to tempt him, is he offers him a normal life. And Jesus has the chance to get down off the cross. He has a chance to marry, have children, live out this normal life that everybody else has around him that he never had a chance to. And then on his deathbed, he realizes and rejects the temptation and goes back to the cross. So the problem that a lot of people had is it's very, very graphic. And a lot of the romance he has with Mary Magdalene in the book and in the film. And a lot of people did not want to consider that they considered it blasphemous. 
But the whole point he was trying to make in the film and in the book is that this is a temptation of Jesus to have a normal life. Another interesting thing about this film is if you are a David Bowie fan, he does play the part of Pilate in this film and does a very good job with it. Even with his British accent playing a Roman governor, he does a great job. It's really interesting. The last is the 1979 The Life of Brian, which caused all sorts of problems with Monty Python whenever they released it. Many people thought that Monty Python and in this movie were mocking Jesus themselves. But the ending, especially seeing while they're all crucified, that really doesn't help their cause a whole lot. And that also caused a lot of, of uh, heartache and issue with people and critics. Now for the next category, which is the one gospel films, where the film is focusing on one of the particular gospels. The first two we're going to look at is the visual Bible and it's the book of Matthew. And this was a well-received film in 1993 when it came out. The main actor is a guy by the name of Bruce uh, Marciano. And he had a Syrian mother and an Italian father, so he looks very much Middle Eastern. Um, it's very human. Jesus... In this, his portrayal of Jesus, he laughs a lot, he smiles a lot, he's very approachable. And so people like this fresh interpretation. He wasn't just somber and staring into the camera without blinking, you know. This was a real Jesus that you could deal with. The opposite position is the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And when this came out, the director, who was kind of controversial, guy by the name of Pierre Passon, Passonelli. He was an atheist and a Marxist. So he even, when he came out with the film, he didn't even want to put saint in the title. He just wanted to put the gospel according to Matthew. But it was released uh, later internationally and they put saint back into it. It's different. It is the most political view and revolutionary view of Jesus on film. They reworked entire passages from Matthew. They omitted sections of it. Um, it was filmed in black and white with a handheld camera. There were really rough edits where in one scene someone may be standing next to him and then the edit jumps and the person's gone next to them. And it was supposed to emphasize the violent revolutionary theme that the director is trying to get across about Jesus. On a little nicer note, we have the 2003 The Gospel of John. And unlike other films, it doesn't deviate at all. Where they cut whole sections out of Matthew for the last film we talked about in this one. It is a word for word for word. Now they are using the today English version Bible, but they don't deviate at all. Jesus in this one is viewed as fully divine. He's always in control. He's cheerful. He's positive. He smiles. It, a lot of people think and critics that this is a very well-balanced Jesus represented in film. And this is probably closer to what he really was like. The next one is the Jesus movie, which is based mainly on the Gospel of Luke. This is probably, or many people say, is the most viewed movie of all time. Campus Crusade for Christ not only funded it, they used it to show on college campuses all across the United States and the world. Um, it's been translated and dubbed in over a thousand languages and as far as I know is still used today. <clears throat> and this takes us to our last category, which is the realistic or historical views of Jesus. Now, the first one we're going to look at is the Nativity Story, which was done in 2006. 
and it's pretty good. The now remember Jesus is only shown for a very brief period of time on the screen. There he is. And he's portrayed by a 20 29 day old Italian baby. Uh, the gentleman who plays Joseph is a Guatemalan actor who was a around 30 at the time and the young lady who plays Mary was only 14 at the time so in cultural marriage laws that's actually probably pretty close to their ages now Joseph may have been a little bit younger than that but Mary probably was in her teens and this particular film was lauded by many people and actually had its premiere in the Vatican City. All right, so then we get to The Passion of the Christ, which was done in 2004. This causes quite a bit of a division. Either people love this film or they really turn another cheek to it because it is the bloodiest film on Jesus and it is following the passion of the Christ meaning it's following the traditional stations of the cross in the Catholic view it covers the last 12 hours of Jesus life I have an entire lecture set aside when people watch this to talk to them about the Catholic aspects because a lot of Protestants don't understand some of the things that are shown in the film exactly and it, it's interesting Mary uh, Jesus's mother has a lot larger role in this film than others and there are some really fascinating parts about it the the language there's no English in in the movie it's Aramaic mostly which was the common language that Jesus and the Apostles would have used there's Hebrew and the Roman soldiers and pilots speak Latin so you have to read subtitles, but it is a beautifully directed film, even though it is pretty hard to watch in parts, especially the scourging scene and the crucifixion. It's the highest grossing Christian film of all time. And the actor who plays Jesus, Jim Carvizo plays Jesus. And he had an incredibly hard time during this production. He was struck by lightning, I believe, twice. He was accidentally scourged during that scene. He had his shoulder dislocated uh, when the cross fell on him once. He got pneumonia. He got hyperthermia. Um, it has, a lot of people think, affected his career. But he does a wonderful job. You can look on YouTube and find some of his discussions where he goes around and talks about how his life was influenced by this film and his belief in God. So this leads us to the last film in the realistic historical, and this is The Son of God. And it was made just a few years ago in 2014, and it actually was a compilation where they took the 10-hour miniseries of the Bible that came out in 2013 they took out the sections of Jesus and they produced this film. Um, the producer was Roma Downey, who used to be the actress on, on Touched by an Angel. They did cut the scenes um, with Satan before they released it to the, the movie theaters. And the reason is because the actor they had who was playing uh, Satan during these scenes looked a whole lot like Barack Obama. So they decided to take those scenes out, even though some people might be upset with that because it, they thought it would be safer than dealing with the political ramifications if they released it with those scenes in. Um, it is not viewed favorably by a lot of critics. It's kind of been called the greatest hits of Jesus, where they focus on mainly the big stuff the big audiences the big miracles they don't talk a whole lot about his teachings necessarily are going to detail about that now dealing with jesus in film this has kind of grown in the last couple of years there are actually several colleges now that offer courses in this 
You see the University of Edinburgh has had a course for a while on Jesus in film. Uh, Belmont has one. And I just noticed the other day that the University of Oklahoma, one of its extension campuses, actually has a film, a course on Jesus in film. And there are several free classes you can take online. Other sources and references you might look into are the two books. One is Jesus, you see on the left, the Gospels and Cinematic Imagination, which is not viewed favorably, even though you do get a cool DVD, which has different scenes from different movies. But the one on the right, Jesus at the Movies, A Guide to the First Hundred Years and Beyond, is actually very good. Um, you can still get it on Amazon and a couple of different places if you want to follow up and perhaps look at the other hundred and what 60 films that I didn't talk about that portray Jesus so that's the end of our discussion today on Jesus and film um, I'm trying to make these lectures a little bit shorter I know that the last few are rather lengthy and our next lecture will be over the Shroud of Turin and the Weapons of Christ Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something new and shalom.